and the airstrikes on our convoy, I don't think were an unfortunate mistake. It was really a direct attack on a clearly marked vehicles whose movements were known. I know Israel is there better than this war being waged. Kitchen founder chef Jose Andrea speaking out after the strike earlier this week killed seven aid workers in his organization. Meantime, President Biden spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during what White House officials privately said would be a tense call. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin also expressed his outrage with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant during a call Wednesday. Joining me now with the latest is Alex Gangitano with The Hill. Alex, what are your sources telling you about the relationship right now between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu? Yeah, so things are pretty tense. As you mentioned today, President Biden spoke with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I think just a matter of, of uh, several minutes ago. And basically they discussed the latest developments in Israel and Gaza coming out of the White House. Um, that's the, the uh, rhetoric we're hearing. But behind the scenes, we're hearing that this is a lot about those airstrikes that killed the seven humanitarian workers. This is the first conversation between Biden and Netanyahu since those um, humanitarian workers were killed as they were feeding people in Gaza amid the crisis there. So that call, as you mentioned, was likely very tense. We've heard that Biden has been privately outraged over the strike. Um, he has publicly said that he mourns the lives that are lost and that, you know, more humanitarian workers and civilians need to be protected. Um, and the last time the two spoke, it was pretty tense, too. That was on March 18th. Uh, Biden warned Netanyahu at the time against authorizing a military operation in Rafa without a clear plan, especially on how to protect civilian lives. So the things things are getting tenser and tenser, it seems like, by the day between the two. Why hasn't Hamas released the remainder of the hostages? That's a big question. I think President Biden would like to know the answer as well of really how to get to the bottom of these negotiations. You know, we've heard for months now that uh, the White House has been involved with negotiations with Egypt and, and Qatar and, um, to, and Israel to try to get a pause in the fighting to release the hostages and that Israel and Hamas cannot come to an agreement um, through these uh, uh, other countries negotiating between them. Um, I think that at this point, a pause in the fighting, we've heard a matter of six weeks is on the table, would also benefit Biden because he could say, you know, we worked on this deal. It's now saving civilian lives because people are taking a break. Um, but for now, things seem pretty stalled on that front. Politically, here in the United States, the war is having an impact on the political conversation. How is this going to impact the dynamics of the 2024 presidential and down ballot races? Yeah, so we're already seeing these protests following President Biden around the country. Just last week, you know, at that huge fundraiser in New York City, um, people interrupted and were protesting him. So it's very visible how angry and outraged uh, people are, especially the Arab American community, Muslim American young voters um, are outraged about this situation. I think we're going to see that spill down to down ballot races as well. I think as the campaign season uh, gets, you know, more robust, we're going to see people um, protest those events too. People running for the Senate and the House and incumbents are going to have to deal with protests. And what we're hearing from sources is that there's a lot of concerns and anxieties over how much this is actually going to impact um, Democrats in November. You know, foreign policy usually gets trumped by, uh, you know, the so-called kitchen table issues like the economy um, when it comes to how people actually vote. But in this case, things are so, um, you know, tense. People are so angry right now that that could be a top issue that people um, are withholding their votes for Democrats on come November. And what about outreach to Jewish Americans? Are they satisfied with President Biden's handling uh, of the Israel-Hamas war? And what impact is this having on Jewish American voters? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, there's been so much focus on the outrage from the other community, from Arab American, Muslim American, um, because they're, you know, are, there's been protests, as I mentioned. Um, but I think Israel and Americans, you know, it's a tricky situation right now because the president has said he's pro-Israel. He wants to back Israel's um, ability to defend itself. Um, and that, you know, has made the Israeli-American population 
feel secure in their relationship with Israel. But, you know, things on the humanitarian front are such a mess in Gaza that um, I think we're seeing some waning support there and just how Netanyahu and in turn uh, President Biden is handling this whole situation. Meanwhile, the secretary Alejandro Mayorkas impeachment is heading to the Senate. What's the latest? Yeah, so we're expecting at this point Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to immediately dismiss these impeachment charges. I mean, this is something that's been a very partisan uh, situation since the beginning. The fact that the House was even getting, able to pass it, and they, you know, if we remember that the they failed the first time um, and barely got the votes to pass this impeachment to send it to the Senate. And so um, this is an unprecedented situation to impeach a cabinet member, and I think we're going to see Schumer quickly try to move ahead and be done with this, especially, you know, there's only several weeks until um, of working weeks between now and the August recess, if you can believe it. And so I think uh, he's ready to move on and not focus too much on this. Did you say August recess? Isn't that crazy? I know. The time is going to fly between now and then. Wow. August recess. I was not, I was sorry. That just stopped me in my tracks. Anyway, you have a story. If on the you Hill. count the weeks, there's not that many between <laughs> now and then. It's wild. We yeah, are that in is, campaign season. Yes. You have a story on the hill.com about abortion and marijuana juicing the vote in Florida. Peel back your reporter's notebook for me. Uh, and it's a gr- excellent reporting folks. Go check it out. Uh, but, but tell us how, how, what your reporting told you about the sunshine state. Yeah. So this week, Um, The Florida Supreme Court issued some important rulings that basically allowed for a ballot measure on um, protecting access to abortion for up to 24 weeks to be on the um, on the ballot in November. And another ruling that would um, have legalizing marijuana be on the ballot in November. These are two issues that young voters really care about. And we're thinking and from talking to sources, they're thinking that these are going to mobilize those young voters in Florida. Just hours after those Supreme Court rulings came out, um, the Biden campaign declared that Florida is officially a state that they're going to try to flip. That's pretty big. I mean, the, uh, that's home to former President Trump, as we know. Um, and it's kind of been the so-called MAGA home as well. Um, but this is a state that they think that issues like abortion, marijuana, um, the economy, the cost of health care, gun violence, all these issues that people are actually going to turn out for Democrats in Florida. That would obviously be huge for the Biden campaign if they could pull this off. But I think they're eyeing young voters as uh, one of the demographics that can help flip this state. Also, Hispanic voters and black voters. Um, and there are there's history on their side as well. You know, in Ohio in 2023, Um, They were ballot initiatives for abortion and marijuana. Um, And both of those, marijuana got legalized and abortion access got um, protected. And so I think they're trying to repeat what happened in Ohio and hope that helps President Biden and some Democrats down in the Sunshine State. Thank you, Alex. Great job as always. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Former President Donald Trump's criminal cases are moving forward in both Georgia and New York. A Georgia judge judge rejected Trump's free speech challenge in his fight to dismiss the state's 2020 election interference case. Trump is charged in connection with allegedly trying to overturn his 2020 defeat in Georgia to President Joe Biden. Meanwhile, in New York, the judge in former President Trump's Stormy Daniels hush money case has refused to delay the trial. The Manhattan judge denied the request earlier this week, and the criminal trial will move forward on April 15th. House Speaker Mike Johnson is making a fresh push for Ukraine aid, even as conservatives have been looking to block momentum on the effort. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has put forward lowering the draft age in Ukraine from 27 to 25 years old. Zelensky said that it was needed in order to bolster the Ukrainian army. New numbers from Emerson College polling show President Biden has narrowed the gap nationally against former President Donald Trump. Biden is now within striking distance, down just 1%. Joining me now with the latest is Spencer Kimball. He is the executive director of the Emerson College Polling Center, who oversaw the poll. Spencer, thanks for joining us. Crunch the numbers for me. How has Biden been able to narrow the gap? Well, when we take a look at that number for Biden, we're looking at 18 to 29-year-olds. And last month, he was winning this group by about six, seven points. 
Now he's up by about 10 points. And so that's how he's been able to close that gap. But it's important to remember that he led this group by 20 points back in 2020. So he still has some room to make up. Remember, he won that national vote poll by over four points last year, uh, last cycle. I find this fascinating because so much of the national conversation specifically about young voters is that Biden has been hurt by them as a result of the Israel-Hamas war. But what you're saying is that he's actually been able to make inroads. Does it have any correlation to his student loan policies, which there's been some developments on in the previous weeks? And if not, what do you correlate that swing and, and bump to? Well, I think you've got uh, obviously a lot of moving parts there. You've got the student loan debt issue that does well for him, particularly with postgraduate students, those with advanced degrees and younger. So he'll pick up some points there. But I also think that there's a natural uh, coalescing of the race between Trump and Biden at this point. A month ago, two months ago, there were still quasi primaries taking place. Now we kind of know who the two candidates are going to be. And it looks like at least the younger vote, they're breaking slightly in Biden's favor at this time. Meanwhile, RFK Jr. has been thrown into the mix. He's on the ballot in North Carolina. What's the impact when you start polling with RFK Jr. in a Trump-Biden matchup? And so these third party candidates, particularly RFK Jr., is pulling the vote away more from Biden than from Trump at this point. Uh, we're not talking about 100 percent of Biden vote or zero percent, but it's about 60, 40. And what we're seeing there is the 30 to 39 year old who were heavy Biden voters are now slipping a little bit away. So while Biden's made up some ground with the 18 to 29 year old, when we throw in that third party, he struggles a little bit with a 30 to 39 year old. So he'll have to try to make some men's with that group as well. Are there any states, because obviously this comes down to the Electoral College, are there any states in particular where RFK is actually helping Biden and hurting Trump? Arizona. That was I the, knew the it. State That's that what I've been saying all along, my friend. I said Maricopa County, RFK Jr. is going to help uh, Biden and not Trump. I apologize for interrupting you. <laughs> No, no. Uh, we're on the same page. Public opinion matching, you know, our conventional wisdom doesn't happen all the time. But what we see here is that Arizona, maybe Michigan, um, maybe Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I would put Wisconsin as number two based on the seven states that we've looked at. North Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania. Uh, out of those seven, I would put uh, Arizona and then Wisconsin as the areas where the third party would help Biden slightly. But in the other five states, they lean towards Trump. Well, and those and those states might decide the entire election and those tens of thousands of voters, specifically in those swing counties outside of uh, uh, Waukesha, if I just announced that right off the top of my head, uh, they actually might be helping uh, Biden as well. There's six percent undecided, which is always fascinating to me. I mean, guys, it's Trump and Biden. What more do you need to know about them? Who are these six percent and what what issue is going to move them? Yeah. So first, it's a small number that's undecided at this point. When we look at some of the Senate races or other races, uh, you usually see 15, 20 percent at this point undecided. But as you mentioned, we know both of these candidates. And so it is a very small number. Generally, these are newer voters coming into the system and uh, they're still looking at these candidates. But what we noticed this month is that the economy jumped up for these voters as their top issue at over 50 percent. In the previous months, the economy was just one of many issues for these undecided voters. And it'll be interesting over the next six, seven months to see if this pattern continues or if these voters go back to a splattering of issues that drive or motivate their vote. So my Democratic sources are telling me that Biden's dropped the term Bidenomics out on the campaign trail. He doesn't like to say Bidenomics because just the polls, the internals are showing that that's not resonating with voters. It's it's much more of a traditional Republican versus Democrat argument, taxing over, uh, higher taxes for the ultra wealthy, lowering taxes or uh, for for middle class Americans. What specific economic issues are helping Biden? We've heard so much about inflation hurting him, but if economics are the top issue, where are Democrats having momentum? 
Well, yes, on the economy, which is generally a Republican issue, what we ask people is, you know, what's your most important issue? And then when we look at the crosstabs, they generally, if they say the economy, they're breaking for Trump 60-40. What we're seeing is Biden is closing that gap, maybe 55-45. There's a variety of issues that are driving the economy. Uh, what we've learned in our focus groups is, for example, affordable housing is what drives a lot of people's attitudes about the economy, being able to uh, have a mortgage or pay the rent. Uh, for other people, it's just job security. So the, the idea of the economy is, is very vast, and other folks are looking at their retirement plans and the stock market. So you have all of these moving parts with the economy, but what we can see is that Biden is growing in confidence amongst voters in his job of running the economy. All right, it's so not talk- as strong as where B- Trump is, but it is stronger than where he was, let's say, six months ago. We talked about foreign policy. We talked about the economy, obviously immigration, another huge issue. Where is that resonating in the poll numbers? Well, immigration has popped off the chart over the last four months. So immigration was sitting in like single digits for the last year and a half, two years. But as we're getting closer to the campaign season, starting in January, that number jumped to 20 percent. Now it's sitting at 22 percent. And we haven't seen it drop in four months. So I expect immigration to be a main theme of this campaign cycle, along with the economy. And then as you see, threats to democracy is still there. But it's kind of an interesting issue in and of itself in that when we think of threats to democracy, some of us might think uh, limitations to access to voting. Other people are thinking that there's too much access to voting and people are uh, voting illegally. So uh, threats to democracy, though it is a democratic issue, it does cut uh, slightly for Republicans when they think about it uh, under another guise. I would say Iran, Russia, and China, but that's just me. Uh, Justin, when you look at the cross tabs uh, specifically for uh, these polls, you guys always ask something fun or something a little offbeat. What's what's like the one factoid before I let you go that jumps out of the cross tabs? Well, I guess dealing with the elections, we would talk about the new voter. Uh, yeah. We asked people who they voted for in the past, and these new voters are breaking for Trump nearly two to one. Wow, thirty-five uh, percent are undecided, but. Usually Democrats are recruiting the younger, newer voters in. So it's interesting to see if those numbers hold. We've been watching those numbers for about five months, pretty steady. So we'll see what the recruitment process is like for the parties. Are new voters young voters or should we not consider new voters young voters? No, they're young voters, generally speaking. Um, And so we've got that group coming in that Biden has to try to bring over to his side. Spencer Campbell, thank you so much uh, for, for breaking down all of those numbers. Of course, Executive Director of Emerson College Polling Center. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Kevin. That's it for today's Daily Debrief. My name is Kevin Cerulli. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.